three. In these programmes, we want to help you make the most of yourself, as the title suggests. But where do we start? We are going to ask you to do a little research into the type of life you lead. And to help you, and to show you what we mean, later in the programme, we will be showing you briefly five other women who will describe their lives. But do please remember, that no two people are exactly alike. You may be similar, but each one of you has your own individual personality. As in all research work, we must begin with the history of our subject, women. We must make a start somewhere. Suppose we take the beginning of our present century, and we have with us Mrs. Brenda Naylor, who will show us what the elegant woman was wearing round about 1907. The look was mature. The hair, bouffant, Marcel waved, back combed. The hat, enormous. The tightly corseted, s bend silhouette was encased in fine fabrics, muslin, maracane, crepe de chine, the bust emphasized by frills and flounces. Loose, soft sleeves emphasised the tiny waist. Fine kid gloves were buttoned with tiny buttons. The neckline was high, whaleboned. A parasol completed the outfit. The silhouette of the working woman was similar, but less exaggerated. This girl might have been in service, but some women worked much harder than that. Like these women working at a coal mine. Legally, politically, economically and socially, women of the 19th century were second-class citizens, subjected to the kinds of prejudices, conventions and restrictions that would be inconceivable to the young woman of today. And they rebelled. But the suffragette movement was not born in the factory, nor in the mine. It was born among Victorian middle-class women like these academics at a degree ceremony attended by Queen Mary. By 1900, women had forced the universities to accept them despite tremendous opposition, and they now turned their attention to the question of suffrage, getting the vote. 66,000 women marched in this procession. In 1906, the Liberals had come to power. They had promised to give women the vote, and they failed to do so. The suffragettes became militant. Some women carry an arrow to show they have been in prison. At one time, nearly a 1,000 women like these were imprisoned for activities ranging from breaking windows to burning down a church. Some women asserted their independence in different ways, like Harriet Quimby, the first woman to fly the channel in 1912, showing she had the same skills as men and the same courage.
But the First World War was the real turning point for women. The suffragettes abandoned their militancy and threw themselves wholeheartedly into war work for king and country. The ordinary woman showed that she could acquire new skills, like these working in a munitions factory. She was even ready to change her skirts for trousers. Women took on many jobs, which by tradition were men's work. Like these police women in a parade at Hyde Park. Fire women too. The war played a great part in breaking down the most rigid barriers between what was considered a male activity and what was considered suitable for a female. At the end of the war, women over 30 were given the vote. In 1928, complete equality was granted, but these bright young things couldn't have cared less. They were too busy enjoying the freedom that their mothers and aunts had fought for. Most important to them was freedom for women to behave and dress as they pleased. Let's start with her head. A cloche pulled well down over the eyes. Cherry, cherry lips. Rouge, bustless, waistless, hipless, the skirt length round about the knee, pale stockings, the T-strap sho shoes, possibly of snake skin. Dresses were long-sleeved or sleeveless, slave bangles, the thing. The fabric, probably marocaine or crepe de chine. Smoking in public, making up in public, emphasised the newfound freedom. Marie Stopes was also fighting a battle for freedom. To release women like this one from the exhaustion and strain on their health of continual and unplanned childbearing. For the working woman too, the war had considerably improved life. The way lay open to new jobs. Women had been trained during the war for more than purely manual or domestic jobs, like these draftswomen. Others were beginning to make themselves indispensable as typists and office workers. While some women sought public office, and by the 1930s, there were a dozen women members of parliament to represent feminine views in the house. Then came the Second World War. Back into uniform for women again, to do men's jobs at home while the men were away. There was absolutely vital factory work to be done. Women set to work again, and again proved their worth. Hair was being worn longer, in rolls or page boy bobs. Hats, often on the front of the head, so far on front they had to be held on with bands around the back of the head. Shoulders were exaggerated, with shoulder pads, even blouses had shoulder pads. Bust, waist and hips, all in the right place. The hem length round about the knee again. Shoes, often with platform soles, sling backs and peep toes. To save labour, the Board of Trade regulations allowed no more than four buttons and three pleats on each outfit. A shoulder bag, come gas mask case, was a fashionable necessity. Christian Dior's new look shocked the world. 
Hats were worn on the back of the head, hair cut short. Little boaters were decorated with flowers, often with spotty veiling. Shoulder pads were swept away. All in one sleeves with underarm gussets emphasized a soft shoulder line. Wide full skirts were held out with stiff petticoats. Basques and peplums were fashionable. The shoes had platform soles, probably peep toes, ankle straps. Long umbrellas were fashionable. Well, you can see how women have changed in the last 50 years. Men's attitude to women have changed also. But most important of all, I think, is a woman's view of her own role. That's altered considerably. What sort of woman are you? What type of life do you lead? If you want to make the most of yourself, you first of all have got to find out who you are. And here are the five women I mentioned earlier doing just that. I lead a very busy life. I'm 21. I live alone in a flat in southwest London. I'm out most of the day. I'm a production assistant to fi five television directors who make educational programs. So as you can imagine, I've, I've got quite a varied job. I like to go dancing. I love going to the cinema, all, all types of films I like to see. I like going to pop concerts as well, especially at the Royal Albert Hall and also pop concerts in Hyde Park in the summer. Sometimes they have free ones, which are very good. I like to wear the most unusual clothes that I can find, and I generally find these at jumble sales or second-hand shops. I've, I don't like to wear clothes that I think I'm going to see other people in, and this is why I wear second-hand ones. I like to wear all different lengths of dresses, some short, some medium, and, and some long. And also, I like trousers very much, especially when I go to parties. I'm a housewife, and I live in a small house in Twickenham. We have a garden, which I enjoy doing. And I have a young baby called Adam, who's nearly one. My main hobby is acting. My husband and I belong to an amateur drama group, and we take part in four or five different plays each year. I like fairly simple clothes. I like them to be bright and colourful and attractive, of course but I also like them to be loose-fitting and comfortable so that when I'm bending down to wipe the baby's nose or the baby's bottom, they don't impede my movements. I love trouser suits. My husband says I've got far too many of them, but uh, I like to wear them particularly when we go out together in the evening. I'm 22 years of age and I work as secretary to the public relations officer at London Zoo. My hobbies are playing tennis in the summer, playing squash in the winter, and I enjoy driving my own car around London. I like casual clothes the most, and that's um, trouser suits, um, or all types of summer dresses, etc. And I particularly like the fashions now, where you can wear trouser suits to parties. I was never very keen on the maxi, although I did buy a maxi coat in the winter, because I think it was very practical for the weather. I have long hair at the moment and I'd like to be able to wear it short, although I wear it up sometimes. It takes me about 12 minutes to put up and it would be marvellous just to have short hair. Well, I'm married and I've got two daughters, one married daughter and one teenage daughter living at home. I cook an evening meal as I have to go to work as a full-time receptionist telephonist. I have to look smart in my job as I'm meeting all different types of people. My main hobbies are sewing, which is very good because I make most of my dresses. I tend to wear a lot of long sleeve dresses at work. Another hobby of mine is walking. I like at the weekends to go on long walks, if it's possible. Sitting down all day, you, you want to walk about a bit at the weekends. I think that I would like to change my speaking voice, as I'm very self-conscious of my northern accent. I'm a widow. My children and grandchildren are overseas. I work as a part-time lecturer and I help at one or two youth clubs. I love the theatre and travelling. And for the type of life I lead, I find most useful a dress and jacket or a tailored suit. What I would like to change would be my hair, something less uh, severe. Well, you'll have a chance to change that in programme six. 
But you've started your analysis. But you haven't. Oh, no. Well, I'm married with two children of school age. I like gardening. I like flower arranging. I like mm, cooking. That will do for a start. But there are a lot of aspect, other aspects of yourself you must analyse before you start work. And it'll be hard work, but it'll be fun too. We have with us Mrs Mary Young, who started classes in poise, dress and personality for the ILEA. Mary, what do you feel about this question of analysis? It's essential because day in, day out, your total look is seen at home, in the street, at work and on social occasions. It is this total look, the whole of you, that this series is all about. How to make the most of yourself, how to improve every aspect of your appearance and manner, but never losing sight of their relationship to the whole, and to help you reach such a standard of poise and confidence in yourself that in due course you will be able to forget appearance and manner in the reassuring knowledge that a high standard has become a natural part of you. Thus you will be able to concentrate and give more of yourself to the important things of life, your personal relationships and your career. But Mary, where do you start? I can only tell you where I start. Other people may start in different ways, but this has been successful for me and my students. Here is a typical class of students at the beginning of our course. Take the total look, the lack of much poise or presence. I ask some of the students to come forward. Let's try to analyse what's wrong. Take a look at their feet. That standing to attention position will always remind you of your gauche schoolgirl days. And what about those turned in toes? I show them how to stand comfortably and elegantly. Let's ask the girls to raise one heel and then flex the knee of the same foot slightly towards the other knee. I do hope you see the improvement in the overall look of each girl. Now I see that most of them have let one hip sag as they flexed the knee. I'm afraid that spoils the total look, any look of poise or presence. Shall we ask them to get their hips level, iron out their diaphragms and generally expand upwards? That's much better. Now we'll ask them to walk forward. Notice how neat and poised it looks when they start with the foot that is slightly flexed forward. So far, so good. But what about those self-conscious arms that look as though they don't know what to do with themselves? I try to suggest that the girls learn to pop their hands lightly into pockets or take a light clasp in front of the body in between an easy controlled swing of the arm. A real improvement. The rest of the class are practicing their stance as they watch. Well, so far we've been looking at the front view or the back view, but we asked two of my students, Mrs. Parrish and Sandra, to come to the studio. Sandra, will you walk so that we see you in profile? Now you see quite clearly why her mother was so keen for her to attend this class. If Sandra doesn't do something about her line, she'll be looking like a tired old lady before she's 30. Sandra, will you line yourself up against the pillar? A straight wall would do tall and straight, with the back of your head in line with your spine. Now walk slowly forward with a shorter stride.
Wonderful. What a difference. Later on, she'll be learning to walk the model girl way. But this is fine for a start. That was much better, wasn't oh, it? Much better, better. Yeah. Mrs. Parrish and Sandra joined my class for a particular reason, because Sandra was getting married. And later on, you're going to see some of the treatments that you might like to have. In the next program, Sandra will be having a pedicure. But let's take a look at Mrs. Parrish's needs, and for this we need the tape measure. So just raise the arms a little, that's right, just elbows up a little. So this is bust round the fullest part. Well, it's a little on the large size, and a good uplift bra will help. Waist, smallest measurement, just firm, without squeezing up. Again, on the large size, but we're going to do lots and lots of waist exercises later on. Now, this is the largest measurement round the curve of the seat. You're not wearing a foundation garment, are you? No. <laughs> 42. Uh, mm. Well, a good foundation garment, properly fitted, will help a lot. Exercise and diet, of course. Eventually, every student will have individual help. Let's take a look at my student, Olive, as she was when she first came to my class. I asked her if she would mind if we analysed her appearance. A bit hidden somehow behind that fringe. We see that she has a lovely hairline and her whole face takes on a more beautiful look without that fringe. We couldn't even see her eyebrows before. Now we see that the eyebrow growth is straggling across the bridge of her nose, giving her an unnecessarily close-set look. A little eyebrow plucking is necessary here. We see that Olive is far from tall, but with her hair swept away from the forehead, she will give a taller impression. She is short and a little too plump and we begin to advise her about reducing. But meanwhile, what she should wear to disguise the plumpness and create a better proportioned look, and the rest of the class are helping. Perhaps you need this sort of transformation. Like Olive, you'll start by taking your measurements, learning to analyze your figure, how to improve it, what clothes to wear to make the best of yourself, how to make up professionally, how to manage your hair, and above all, how to organize your life, day in, day out, week in, week out, so that you can look your best at all times. If all this seems a long way from the finished product, let's take a look at the transformation we can bring about. We have improved the total look in several ways. We have taken her fringe away from her forehead to show her hairline and plucked her eyebrows to give a tidier appearance. She has been carefully made up and she can be confident that she looks well groomed. We have piled her hair up, away from her neck, which makes her look taller. She has a simple dress, not too tightly fitting, with nothing to break its smooth line. The low neckline on her dress emphasizes a beautiful neck and helps to balance the bust line. The length of the dress is short, but not too short, because a skimpy mini would be out of proportion for her figure. She is not wearing socks or boots, so she has an unbroken leg line, and toning stockings and shoes help the look of length. Learning to walk and stand properly has made all the difference to her total look 
and her air of confidence.